Okay, okay. Gather round, you f***ing buzzards. Now that I have your attention with the clickbaity blonde Jack Sparrow person, let's talk about something a bit more important. This video won't be so much about Lauren Southern, but rather an idea that she introduced me to. You might remember from my last video that there was a clip of her recommending that we address the refugee problem by adopting the model of Australia. Like, I don't think those boats should be going through the Mediterranean. I think that people are drowning because of that, and they should probably have a policy similar to Australia, where they're like, no, you go through the proper refugee migrant process, otherwise we get increased drownings. I wasn't too sure how married she was to this idea, so I just left it aside. But since then, we actually ended up speaking on her live stream, so that was a whole thing. And she seems pretty attached to it. Because that's always the argument I've made. If you look at the Australian system, where they have zero drownings happening, it's because they have zero pull factor and they don't let people enter. So we know for a fact the Australian system has worked, actually put in legal applications like they do in Australia with zero drownings. Of course, I don't want people drowning. And that's why I personally support the Australian system, which has led to zero people drowning because it's not like the Australian policy. If you try to enter the country, you won't You'll just be sent to Christmas Island if you try to enter Australia. You won't be allowed in the country whatsoever. Mate, like, I don't know what to tell you. There's a reason why Australia has the policies they do and why they have worked so well. What, they get put into a detention? I, 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 I don't know. I feel like I'm going to look at there, there needs Australia to be... for the next day or two and <laughs> yeah. find that there's massive, like, human rights abuses happening in Christmas Island. And again, okay, okay, f*** off. Now, I'm a curious person, and it turns out that Australia's approach to refugees is especially relevant today. It ties very closely to the situation in Afghanistan, and also to the immigration debate in the UK, the US, and in Denmark. So, let's see what's going on there. Part 1. Stop the boats. So, here's a breakdown of how the migration route to Australia works. The original countries being fled in this case are Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar. And I'm sure some of you are asking, why Australia? Why don't they go somewhere closer? Well, I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that the overwhelming majority of them do. Bangladesh currently hosts over 800,000 Rohingya Muslims in the largest refugee camp in the world. 1.4 million Afghan refugees are currently in Pakistan, and another 800,000 are in Iran. But every year, thousands of these people decide to risk their lives traveling to Thailand, Indonesia, and Malaysia in hope of eventually getting to Australia. Compared to the number of people staying in neighboring countries, the number of arrivals to Australia has always been fairly low. In its busiest year, the number of asylum seekers arriving by sea was just over 24,000, which, compared to the number of people living in refugee camps, is... yeah. But for the Australian politicians, including the Labour Party, this was still too many. Here's what they did. Australia's unique approach to refugees can be broken up into two distinct phases. The first was called offshore processing, which was introduced by the Labour Party in 2012. This involved the prolonged detention of new arrivals within Australia, and then gradually moving them for offshore processing outside of the country. By 2013, anyone who arrived by boat was permanently banned from the Australian mainland and detained in offshore facilities mostly in the ex-colonies of Nauru and Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. The idea was that this would serve as a deterrent against people traveling from Indonesia, but over the next two years, the number of crossings hadn't changed. Which isn't surprising given that almost all of the people being processed in these detention centers were found out to be refugees. What became of them over the next few years We'll find out soon. But with the deterrent failing, the Australian government decided to step things up. In 2014, they stopped taking people in for offshore processing and implemented a policy called Operation Sovereign Borders. From then on, every boat that was found trying to enter Australia was pushed back to Indonesia. The number of recorded crossings fell to zero, as did the recorded number of drownings. Notice how I emphasize the word recorded there, we'll, we'll come back to that. The policy was hailed as a success by the Australian government, as well as by Donald Trump. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, kept a laser-cut model of an Asian fishing boat in his office with the words, I stopped these etched into it, which is normal. Earlier this year, the offshore processing model was adopted in Denmark, and the UK have recently been trying to do the same. Their plans have involved the detainment of people in the British territory of Ascension Island, which is way over here, 
and more recently by training border officials to send migrant boats back to France, and even giving them legal immunity if anyone dies in the process. Provided the act is done in um, good faith, of course. F*** So if this is what they're going to do in my country, I would hope that the Australian model has been somewhat successful. Let's look into that. Part 2. International Law So I'm just going to get all of the legal carry-on out of the way first. Since it was introduced in 2012, the Australian refugee policy has been pretty widely condemned. The accusations laid against them include, but are not limited to, sending asylum seekers to Indonesia despite its record of human rights abuses, using enhanced screening procedures on people in the middle of the sea with no lawyers present, violating international laws on cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment, violating the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights with unnecessary and prolonged detentions, and violating the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. But if you're on the other side of the argument, you can always just say F*** international law, you f***ing globalist prick. What about my national sovereignty and f***ing get out of my country, f***ing glacier? And I could say, well, Australia doesn't believe that. They've had no problem relying on international courts when it comes to trade and all these other things. In 2010, they even took Japan to the international courts for whaling in the Antarctic, but we don't need to go there. After all, legal arguments are nothing unless you can back them up morally or practically. Instead, I thought we could judge Australia's approach on its own terms. Why did they think it was a good idea, and did it accomplish the things that they said it would? And according to them, the policy was supposed to accomplish three things. To break the smuggling business, to save lives, and to alleviate the financial burden of dependent asylum seekers. Don't worry about that blank space at the bottom, by the way, that's, that's nothing. Part 3 breaking the smuggling business. So we do know that offshore processing on its own didn't achieve this. After it was made clear that people arriving by boat would be banned from Australia and detained offshore, the number of crossings remained roughly the same. This did change after 2014 when everyone who tried to cross was pushed back to Indonesia, but whether or not this hurt the smuggling industry is very unclear. Partially because in 2015, the Australian Border Force Act made it illegal for anyone who works in immigration and border control to disclose information about their work. So the claim that there have been zero crossings and drowning since 2014 is actually not true. The correct number is, we don't know. And when Australian senators try to ask any questions about what's happening at sea, they get answers like this. It's been put to us that 32 thousand US dollars was handed uh, to the crew uh, to return these the two Australian provided vessels so thirty two thousand dollars in cash uh, plus two new boats um, to turn around and to go to Indonesia do you refute those claims uh, Senator uh, unfortunately as as part of the um, or under the uh, constraints of the minister's public interest immunity claim I'm not able to answer uh, any detail in yeah. relation to that now <laughs> I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but the fact that the Australian government was so keen to brag about its border control one minute and then impose very unique secrecy laws on it the next is kind of suspicious. But in any case, it isn't unusual for smugglers to adapt in response to crackdowns. Often they'll resort to using smaller boats and alternative routes to avoid detection. In fact, we know they've been doing this and the claim that the boats were stopped is actually empirically false. In the years following 2014, several boats arrived in the Cocos Keeling Islands, Saibai Island, and in far north Queensland. All of which are part of Australia. Wait, 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 but I thought you stopped the boats, Scott. Well, it turns out they didn't. It's just that for some parts of Australia, they stopped counting. And that method of them being a bunch of lying faced liars was revealed in 2017 when the Australian immigration minister boasted that there hadn't been a successful crossing in over 1,100 days. And that same day, his words were referenced in this bizarre exchange between a Labour senator and the acting commissioner of Border Force. Did a boat arrive on Saibai Island on the 20th of August? Yes. It was. And did it involve six Chinese nationals? Yes. And was there a New Guinean people smuggler involved? Uh, there was a New Guinean uh, person on there, yes. And 
why is that not a rival in Australia? It's not an arrival under the scope of Operation Sovereign Borders, is that what you mean? Now, oh, I, I see. So, I, I want it to be clear, so just so long as we understand what 1,000 days means, it doesn't mean Chinese, it doesn't mean East Coast. No, no, Senator, no. We get illegal arrivals in Australia at the border all the time, and have done for many years, as you know. The reason Operation Sovereign Borders was set up was not to deal with Papua New Guinea. Uh, as I articulated, it was to do with people arriving on the high seas, uh, primarily out of Indonesia and Sri Lanka. So that's an Australian border official admitting that they didn't really stop the boats so much as move the goalposts. Or in this case, the borders of an entire country. Since 2014, they've also been accused of paying people smugglers to return to Indonesia with their passengers, and they have admitted to making unauthorized incursions into Indonesia to push them back themselves, often against the wishes of the Indonesian government, but we don't need to get into that here. Because the evidence that this did anything to hurt the smuggling business just isn't there. The refugee populations in Malaysia and Indonesia continued to rise at their usual rate after the boats were stopped. Given that neither of these are considered safe countries for asylum seekers, it's completely unreasonable to expect people to settle there. Instead, pushing people back would risk them being thrown straight back into the hands of smugglers and on routes often more dangerous than the first one they tried. It's also worth remembering that boats are not the only point of entry. For Australia, and most countries, there are two ways you can claim asylum. The first is to arrive on a boat, and the second is to fly in on a temporary visa and make your claim when you're there. The people who arrive on boats were labelled as queue jumpers, which is partially why the government shut them down. It is true that stopping the boats did coincide with an increase in people arriving by plane, but here's the problem. We've already seen that most of the people arriving by boat are found out to be refugees. However, this number drops to around 45% for people who fly over. So the people doing it quote unquote the right way are actually the ones who are far more likely to fail the vetting process. And really, that's understandable. After all, if you were able to get a visa and a flight, then maybe your home country wasn't so bad after all, grumble grumble. Right-wing pundits often do this thing where they place refugees in a kind of catch-22, where they're always either too poorly or not poorly enough. One minute it's, look, they have iPhones and nice shoes, and they, they're not suffering. And then the next it's, oh, look, they risk their lives on a dinghy boat, but they don't have any documents. So what, why don't they just come the proper way? It's like the only acceptable refugee for these people is some kind of like shell-shocked wretch who drags himself on shore with half their limbs blown off, but also their passport and all their documentation intact. But coming back to that 45% number, that was before the boats were stopped. By 2019, the number of rejections had risen to 84%, and the number of people seeking protection visas had skyrocketed. It also became apparent that many of these people had sold themselves into the hands of traffickers, suggesting that the smuggling problem hadn't actually been addressed. It had simply been moved out of the sea and into the air. The problem with just trying to clamp down on the smuggling industry is that smuggling isn't the root of the problem. The root of the problem is people being forced to flee their homes with no safe passages available to them. And as long as that issue persists, the demand for smugglers will always be there. The only thing Australia managed to do here was to briefly make it someone else's problem. And the same goes for whether or not they really saved lives. Even if we grant that the number of drownings had gone to zero, even though the secrecy laws are like definitely not the kind of thing you do when you have a successful border policy, and that pushbacks in Libya and northern Indonesia are well known to result in people dying. Okay, this is a pretty long tangent. Interceptions and pushbacks are inherently dangerous. You are forcibly returning people to a place that they've just risked their lives trying to get away from, and you're doing it, often to over a hundred people at a time, in a crowded boat in the middle of the sea. And it's no surprise that these pushbacks are often confrontational. They result in violent clashes, people throwing themselves overboard in desperation, and it isn't untoward for boats to rupture and sink in the process. And of course, before the secrecy laws, pushbacks in Australia were known to have resulted in deaths, so just saying. But okay, even if we grant that the drownings had stopped, the more important question is, what happened to the people trying to cross? 
well, if they were pushed back to Indonesia, they would most likely have to face the brutality of detention centers and open prisons, or just attempt even more dangerous smuggling routes elsewhere, both of which have been shown to happen. The idea that this was being done with humanitarian intentions doesn't really hold if they were saving lives one minute, only to destroy them the next. But as for the asylum seekers who were taken into offshore processing, well, part four, saving lives. Since 2012, over 4,000 people were sent to Nauru or Manus Island for offshore processing in detention centers operated by private contractors. Legally, detentions like this are only supposed to be used in rare cases and for the shortest time necessary. However, most of these people are banned from entering Australia and have spent the best part of a decade in a state of limbo described as temporary forever, with no legal or emotional certainty. The conditions on these islands are an abomination. Multiple families are crowded into tents that are considered unsuitable for long-term accommodation, especially in the humid weather. Temperatures inside the tents can reach above 50 degrees Celsius, with limited shade in the surrounding area. The islands have been visited several times by doctors and inspectors who have described the mental state of the interns as tantamount to that of torture victims. The sexual abuse of women and children was endemic. Children were seen playing with cockroaches instead of toys. People as young as five years old had made suicide attempts. Families were deliberately separated. Men who had fled on the basis of their sexuality were knowingly sent to Papua New Guinea, where homosexuality is still illegal. By 2018, several children on Nauru started presenting with an extremely rare psychiatric condition known as Resignation Syndrome, an illness that seems almost exclusively reserved for asylum seeker children. The disorder, which starts with extreme depression, lethargy, and cognitive impairment, eventually progresses into the child becoming catatonic and having to be fed through a tube. There have also been six reported suicides, one murder, and at least one person had died of preventable causes after his medical evacuation to Australia was delayed. As for the financial cost, I'm sure it's obvious that building and maintaining offshore detention centers, especially when you have to evacuate someone every time there's a health emergency, would be quite expensive. Here are some comparisons. The average cost for an asylum seeker on a bridging visa in Australia is $4,429. The average cost to hold someone in detention within Australia is $362,000. And the average cost to hold one individual offshore in Nauru or Manus Island is $3.4 million. In 2020, the detention center on Christmas Island, which had cost the Australian taxpayer $26 million, had consisted of 109 staff and only four detainees, two of whom are children who were born in Australia. And that isn't even to mention the multiple court cases held against the Australian government for human rights abuses, including a class action lawsuit that cost them $90 million. So why the f*** are they doing this again? Well, there's that not so secret fourth objective, of course. The only one that it actually achieves to keep them out of Australia. And it didn't even succeed at that. By 2019, Almost all of the people detained in Nauru and Manus Island were evacuated for physical and mental health emergencies. Where were they evacuated to? Australia. The number of asylum seekers on both islands, which peaked at 2,500 in 2014, is now down to 263. And in total, almost half of the 4,000 people taken in for offshore processing are currently in Australia, either receiving treatment or just hanging in limbo with no civil rights, confirmed refugees or not. This policy is a f***ing disaster which has failed on every count. The Australian government have essentially just spent billions of dollars on abusing people in offshore islands or sending them back straight into the same situation that made them flee in the first place. And what exactly was the underlying issue that led to this? Well, the underlying problem was that every year a few thousand people less than 0.1% of Australia's population were seeking protection. That's it. This had nothing to do with queue jumpers or the smuggling industry, and it definitely had nothing to do with saving lives. The only thing they achieved was to take the problem and put it somewhere else. Now, Lauren, my European friend, look, we're in the same boat here. I'm descended from brown people, 
you're also apparently descended from brown people? It's... Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> it's saying I'm Spanish. I'm so confused right now. <sighs> from watching your content and from our conversation, you seem pretty insistent that the humanity of refugees is something that you want to consider in your arguments. Well, a few years ago, you were helping a group that wanted to send asylum seekers to Libya, even though it was well known at the time that Libyan detention centers were indistinguishable from concentration camps, so that's bad. And today, you're arguing for this bullshit. If you could, like, stop advocating against human rights for no reason, that would be cool. <laughs> 